What's up everyone and thanks for joining me again this week. In last week's episode, we looked at how SQL Server may output unintended results from math calculations if you're unaware or unfamiliar with how it handles implicit conversions and data type precedence. This week, I wanna share another scenario where the output of a math equation may not be what you expect because of a funny way that SQL Server handles some numbers. But before we dive in, I just wanna share with you how I first encountered this issue in the real world. Many years ago when I was working on an SSRS report, I was trying to build a stacked bar chart. And the stacked bar chart was intended to show the percentage breakdown of distinct values in a table. So basically maybe the number of the value A that I had in a particular column for a table made up 30% of uh, the total number of rows, uh, the value of B made up another 20% and so on until we had this entire uh, stacked bar chart that should have added up to 100%. The thing is though, it didn't add up to 100%. It added up to something like 97 or 98%. And it took me a while to figure out why exactly my numbers weren't adding up. I had data for all of my fields, right? There weren't nulls, there weren't any missing values. Uh, because I was just dividing a distinct count over my total count, I should have been getting a percentage that added up to 100%, yet SQL Server was outputting a number that wasn't quite that. What I eventually found out was my query wasn't adding up to 100% because of floating point arithmetic errors, and that's what today's episode is about. So let's start by looking at a simple example of what floating point errors actually are. In this query, you can see I am just doing a basic select statement with a case when uh, that's saying if I add the value of 0.1 and 0.2 and they're equal to 0.3, uh, then output a one else a zero. So 0.1 plus 0.2 should equal 0.3. Uh, but the interesting thing here is that if we actually run this query, we'll see that this case statement outputs zero. This is an example of a floating point error. Um, and I'll get into what that means in a moment. And so for the first time that a lot of people see this kind of uh, addition not working, this calculation not working, uh, they wonder what's going on. And so to understand that, we have to understand a little bit of how floating point data types are stored. And just as a quick side note, this isn't specific to SQL Server at all. This is, you know, occurs in any programming language, any kind of system that implements uh, floating point numbers. It's, you know, it's not a bug or anything like that. It's just a weird kind of edge case or thing that you need to know about to be aware of so that you don't get these problems with your data in the real world. All right, so let's actually take a step back and just see how SQL Server stores integers. An integer in SQL Server can have about 4 billion different unique values from about negative 2 billion to positive 2 billion and change. And the way that integer values are stored are actual representations of those values from negative 2 billion to positive 2 billion. Um, the binary representation is truly just that exact integer and integer accurately represents all of those numbers in that range. But now float data types are a little bit interesting. They uh, actually are able to store a much wider range of numbers. If you think about it, right, that makes sense because integers are just whole numbers. Uh, so uh, if you think of a number line, you're only catching those whole numbers and not all the numbers numbers in between. A float, because it contains a decimal, has to basically capture an infinite number of numbers, uh, both the whole numbers and all the numbers in between. And the range of a four byte float inside SQL Server is actually 10 to the negative 38th to all the way to 10 to the positive 38th. I don't even know what that number is called, but it is huge. And the way SQL Server achieves being able to store so many more values in the same four bytes of space is that floats are just an approximation. There's a compression that occurs in the encoding of a floating point number, uh, which we'll take a look at in a minute, that allows this much larger range of data to be stored, but at the cost of sometimes your values are not perfectly accurate. So in short, the way a float stores its value is by first storing a range of, of where the actual value exists. So let's say we wanna represent the value 17. Uh, you may store a range from zero to 100. 
And then the second part of the float stores a percentage or a fraction of where that number falls within the range. So if our range is zero to 100, the second part of our float may store something like 17% and we would get our value of 17. And that's a really oversimplified example, right? I'm kind of giving you these nice big round numbers in base 10 because as humans, that's what we're used to kind of thinking about. But floating point numbers are encoded in binary and so everything is in base two. So let's actually break down how this floating point number data gets encoded. And so if you check out the Wikipedia page for single precision floating point numbers, uh, it's actually very precise on how it does it, but it uses a bunch of math symbols that I honestly haven't used since high school and I don't really remember how to do them. So I figured this is a SQL channel. Let's kind of rewrite this and show how floating point numbers work and how the error occurs using SQL syntax. But this Wikipedia page does give us a nice example. So we will kind of replicate uh, what it's doing. So if you want to kind of go back and forth on your own and try out the SQL version, try out the Wikipedia version, you can kind of put two and two together and have even a better understanding. But in this example, we are looking at this number 0.15625. Um, and all of those 32 bits of data next to there, the ones and zeros are our actual floating point number encoding. And the way the encoding method works is that the first bit or the 32nd bit uh, is just for a sign whether our number is gonna be positive or negative. And so the next eight bits in green indicate our exponent. Uh, this tells us our range of numbers that we're in. Uh, but since we're using binary, right, we're not getting these nice and easy zero to 100 ranges. We're dealing with ranges that are in base two. But this is kind of nice because we only have to store the starting number of our range because we know the ending number of our range would just be the next power of two up. So if we're trying to represent a number uh, in the range from two to eight, we can only we only have to store the two, uh, you know, which is two to the second, because we know that two to the third, right, is eight, and that's just the natural progression of the sequence. We don't actually need to store it. We get some compression there. But the bigger compression savings we get is from the last 23 bits of information in this floating point encoding. This is where we are storing the fraction of, you know, the percentage of where our number falls between our range, right, defined by that, uh, the, the bits in the green part of our number. And these bits are also stored in binary, but we're doing them as an inverse, so we're actually doing one over two raised to the power of whichever bit we're currently at. So uh, I know that's all kind of vague. Let's look at the SQL Server implementation to get a better idea of how this works. So if I jump over to my SQL query, you'll see here are the three kind of variables that we'll be dealing with. Uh, we have the sign bit and we have our exponent. Uh, which I'm both just storing as ints to keep things simple because they will just be whole numbers. And then we have fraction, which uh, surprisingly I'm not storing as a float, I'm storing as a decimal. Uh, and that's a little bit of foreshadowing right there. Uh, you'll see why I do that at the very end of this video. But, but we have these three variables to store the parts of our encoded floating point number, right? That 0.15625 value. And we can kind of do that here, right? So sign, uh, is a very simple bit, right? It's either just zero or one for whether it's positive or negative. And so in this case, zero means it's positive, which is fine. Our exponent value is pretty simple. So what we do in this case is just take each bit and raise it to the power of the position of that bit, right? Relative in that eight digit sequence, right? So it'd be just zero times two to the power of seven plus one times the power of, of, you know, two raised to the six and so on and so forth until we get our value of 124 uh, by just doing that summation sequence. This is your typical convert binary to decimal kind of equation done in SQL Server. And I realized I could have written some functions or loops to do this, but I wanted to keep things as simple as possible. So I just copy pasted and wrote it all out. And for our last variable, if we look at that, right, our fraction, we are doing the same thing. But like I said, we're doing one over two to the power of whichever bit we're at. Um, and we're doing that for all 23 bits. And in the case of this example that we're using, there's actually only one bit which has a number one. So we are keeping it there. So it's just one times one over the power or sorry, one over two to the power of two. Um, and that is our fraction, which comes out to be 0.25. So if we actually go ahead and put that all together into the floating point number encoding equation. We'll see we have our, our sign portion here and we have our exponent, which we uh, just as part of the equation, we subtract a negative 127. And you can see, once again, we're using decimal here. You'll see why. And finally, we are taking our fractional portion and just sticking a one in front of it. 
um, to be able to kind of get that percentage of where does our number fall inside the range you know defined here and so I've, I've also written out above here kind of what that math looks like without all the extra SQL functions but if we go ahead and run this you will see we get the intended value of 0.15625 exactly the same as the Wikipedia example now this number is a special case. There is actually no floating point conversion error. We can get a precise number stored uh, with this 0.15625 because as you saw the one over two to the two, right, is just 0.25 and if we multiply that uh, within our range, we get this precise number and there's no error at all. If you were to go ahead and do this again with a 0.1 or a 0.2, like I kind of uh, showed you at the start of this video, you would see that those numbers aren't actually 0.1 and 0.2. They're 0.100000 and then some kind of small, uh, you know, additional numbers there, slightly larger than 0.1. And the 0.2 is actually 0.2000 with some additional numbers at the end, making it slightly larger than 0.2. So when you add the slightly larger than 0.1 and the slightly larger than 0.2, two together, you get a number that's slightly larger than 0.3, which doesn't actually equal just plain old 0.3, which is why that case statement returns a zero. All right, so how do you fix this? Well, there's a few different things you could do. And by far the easiest thing to do is just not care about it. Sometimes your data needs to be accurate, but not always. If your data doesn't need to be perfectly accurate to those infinitesimally small uh, decimal places, then Float may be a perfectly fine data type for you. Just be aware that if you are compounding a lot of floating point errors by doing a lot of addition, um, like I was doing in my stacked bar chart, those errors can compound and they actually will become something that you will notice and may cause problems for you. So the second option you can do is if you're you know, diehard, you wanna store floats because of all the space savings, but you do wanna handle kind of these, these little rounding issues is just to handle the rounding logic in your application layer and you know, to be able to handle that, you know, hey, I know this data coming back is a float, I just need to be sure that I'm getting even accurate numbers and not these slight approximations. I don't particularly like that solution, I've seen it done before, I don't even know if it's a best practice or not. Um, I generally stay away from it because it's just too much work compared to the third option, which is using something like a decimal data type. And by this point, you probably know why in my scripts I was using the decimal data type um, in all my different calculations because I, I didn't want to get these uh, floating point errors as part of my query, so I had to use decimal. And decimal is great. It is able to store very accurate numbers. There's no errors that happen with it. The only downsides are is that they take up a lot more space depending on how large of a number you need to store. Um, they also don't store as large of a number as floats potentially do, but, but I don't know why you would need 10 to the 38th places of uh, numbers anyway. I mean, that's huge. If you have a use case for that, let me know. I'd be curious. But in the end, floating points, right, probably are good enough for your applications unless you are working at a bank or you're, you know, shooting up rockets into the sky or something. Probably more important to use more precise data types there. Uh, but if you're not, it's just something to be aware of. If your numbers aren't adding up, check to see if it's a floating point error um, because it does happen in the wild. So thanks again for watching. I hope you learned a little bit more about floating point arithmetic and the problems that can come from it. And if you're not already a subscriber, be sure to subscribe for more videos like this in the future, and I'll see you next time. Thanks.